Good morning, church. It's good to be with you this morning as we gather for worship. I see a lot of uh, friendly new faces here this morning. Why don't you uh, stand with me and seek out a, a new face, say hello, overwhelm them with love, and let them know you're glad to see them, and let your brothers and sisters know you're glad to see them this morning. Make your way back to your pews. We'll have Amy Lucas come now and bring us our morning announcements. Good morning. Welcome to Beverly Heights Church. We're so glad that you're here with us this morning. If you are visiting with us, we'd love for you to let us know you're here. There are um, in the pews, there are visitor cards, and you can fill that out and um, give us your contact information. We can check in with you this week and uh, see if there's anything we can do for you here at Beverly Heights Church and uh, answer any questions you might have about the ministry here. I do want to highlight a few items for you. I invite you to pick up a copy of Gathered Seeds this week. It has all of our announcements and prayer requests. You can find it at the back entrances where you come in or in the hallway behind me here um, right next to the water fountain. And I wanted to highlight Fusion will take place again this evening. That is for our 6th through 12th graders. They'll gather tonight at 6.30 p.m. Um, here down in the social room or outside. Um, so if you have a child in that age range, we would love for them to come and join in the fun this evening. Wednesday Night Heights was off to a great start this past week. It will continue this week. Uh, 4.15 is when our programming begins for our four-year-olds all the way up through 12th graders. And then we have dinner together in the social room at 5.45 p.m. And so we invite you to come and join us for that. We would love to know that you're coming for dinner. So if you plan to come, everyone is invited to dinner. We, if you plan to come, uh, please let us know. You can use the form that got emailed out last week from Jen Tan, or you can uh, contact the main office and we can make a reservation for you as well. Our pumpkin patch event is coming up quickly and that is on Saturday, October 21st. It is for our children ages birth through kindergarten and their families. Uh, we invite you to make a reservation by going to beverlyheights.org slash pumpkin and the forum there will let you make a reservation and that is open to all in the community, invite a friend to come, um, but we invite you to make that reservation so we can make good plans for uh, and preparations for that event. And then the men's chili cook-off uh, is coming up on Saturday, October 14th, and that will be at 4.30 p.m. You can sign up at beverlyheights.org slash chili, and uh, we already have many more um, chili recipes have come in, or chili contestants, I guess I should say, um, and a, a matter of clarification, I found out this week that many don't know how a chili cook-off works, and we just assumed that people did because in our neighborhood we have an annual chili cook-off that Nadine Michaelak runs that is phenomenal. And so I will let you know that the men who come, you will taste test, a blind taste test of all the chilies that come in, a little small cup of them, and you'll have a voting form so you'll be able to take notes and keep track of, your, of the chilies and which ones you like, and then there'll be a vote at the end, and it's a very scientific process. No, um, but you will get to taste all the chilies, and enjoy them and then also then um, all the leftovers will be enjoyed together as well after after the official voting takes place but it should be a really fun event so if you haven't signed up to come we invite you to do so thank you well now I'd like to invite you to join with me as we prepare our hearts and our minds for worship
Please take your bulletin and join with me now in our invitation to worship. Lord Jesus Christ, make us one. Heavenly Father, it is our desire to join together in glad adoration, to enter into the joy of being in your presence this day, this hour. We pray, Lord, for that special presence that comes by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit as you condescend to us in worship. We pray, Lord, that you would indeed inhabit our praise and our worship, that you also would be glorified above all things. We give ourselves to you fully and freely. We pray, Lord, that you would be glorified, and we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Our opening hymn of praise this morning is found in the Trinity Hymnal. I'd like to invite you to take that, to turn to hymn 101, to stand with me as we sing verses 1 through 4. Come thou, almighty King. in our responsive reading. Our responsive reading this morning is from Psalm 29. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Worship the Lord in the of waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord of the many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. 
The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. Our hymn of praise is This Is My Father's World. You can find it in your Trinity hymnal, number 111. We'll sing verses 1 through 3. This is our Father's world because the Lord is King. And we come into the presence of Almighty God this morning. We come into the presence of His royalty, of His glory, His majesty, and His holiness. And so it is good and right and proper for us to recognize who God is and who we are. And who we are are sinners. And so we have the opportunity this morning to confess that sin, to relinquish it to God and to allow God to minister his grace, his mercy, his healing in our lives. So I'd like to invite you to take your bulletin to join with me in our unison confession of sin, after which we will spend time in silent and private confession. Joining together, merciful God, in your gracious presence, we confess our sin and the sin of this world. Although Christ is among us as our peace, we are a people divided against ourselves as we cling to the values of a broken world. The fears and jealousies that we harbor set neighbor against neighbor and nation against nation. We abuse your good gifts and turn them into bonds of oppression. Lord, have mercy on us. Heal and forgive us. Set us free to serve you in the world as agents of your reconciling love in Jesus Christ. Amen. If you would now bow your heads and your hearts with me as we pray. Heavenly Father, as we enter into your presence this day, as we come into the presence of your holiness, we do confess and recognize who we are. We confess our sin. 
the sins of this world, and the manner in which we so desperately cling to the pattern of this world, that you've called us to be transformed, the renewing of our mind by grace and power, through the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross, to be made new creatures, to be healed, redeemed, restored, and forgiven. And so we come to you this day, this hour, and we bring ourselves not only before you, but our sins. We search our hearts and our minds. And we ask, Lord, that you would give us the confidence, the courage, the strength to confess freely before you. And the hope and the knowledge that you love us and that you will forgive us. And so, Lord, hear our prayers. Oh Lord, we come before you today and we confess that as a people and as individuals, as a community, we have been unfaithful. Lord, that is difficult to say, but we know it is true. And we say that with confidence in the hope and the love that you have for unfaithful men and women. We think of the prophet Hosea whom you called to love and to serve and to be united with an unfaithful spouse. And how you, Lord, have suffered long with us who continually to run after other lovers as we seek our own ends, our own purposes, as we divide ourselves away from you and from one another, we confess our sin. And we ask you, Lord, to be kind, to be gracious, to again show us that love, to draw us back to yourself, and to hear the words of the prophet when he said, speaking for you, O Ephraim, How can I give you up? Oh, my bride, I love you. We thank you, Lord, that you love us with an enduring love. That you are faithful toward us with your covenant faithfulness. That you renew us day by day. You give us mercy. You show us the way and you offer to us strength so that we might walk in the paths of righteousness. So help us, Lord, to renew that covenant today, that relationship with you and with one another. Reunite us back to you so that we might be bonded to you in love and bonded anew with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Friends, hear the good news of the gospel. Because Jesus died and rose again, because he is the head of the church, because he is the bridegroom and we are the bride, and that he served us in love faithfully, even to the point of shedding his own blood, because he calls us to him and he renews us day by day. Our sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. They are forgiven indeed. Thanks be to God and all God's people said, Amen. As we confess our sins, we also have the opportunity to renew our strength as we confess and stand on what it is that we believe. And so I invite you to stand with me and to turn to the back of the Trinity hymnal to page 845 
as we recite together and confess our belief in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit through the Apostles' Creed. Brothers and sisters in Christ, what is it that we believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Join with me now as we sing and worship the Lord with hymn 691, It Is Well With My Soul.
At this time, I invite you to join me for this morning's scripture lesson. I will warn you of a typo in the uh, program here. If you look for Jeremiah in the New Testament, you will not find it. Uh, it is in the Old Testament. Jeremiah uh, was a prophet during a tumultuous time. And the last faithful king of Judah, King Josiah, Jeremiah had to bring a difficult word. So this is a difficult word from Jeremiah to us this morning. Chapter 6, starting in verse 1 through verse 15. Waiting for those papers to stop turning until everybody gets there. There we go. Flee for safety, O people of Benjamin, from the midst of Jerusalem. Blow the trumpet in Tekoa and raise a signal on Beth Hakerim. For disaster looms out of the north and great destruction. The lovely and delicately bred I will destroy, the daughter of Zion. Shepherds with their flocks shall come against her. They shall pitch their tents around her. They shall pasture each in his place. Prepare war against her. Arise and let us attack at noon. Woe to us, for the day declines, for the shadows of evening lengthen. Arise and let us attack by night and destroy her palaces. For thus says the Lord of hosts, cut down her trees, cast up a siege mound against Jerusalem. This is the city that must be punished. There is nothing but oppression within her, as a well keeps its water fresh, so she keeps fresh her evil. Violence and destruction are heard within her. Sickness and wounds are ever before me. Be warned, O Jerusalem, lest I turn from you in disgust, lest I make a, you a desolation, an uninhabited land. Thus says the Lord of hosts, they shall glean thoroughly as a vine the remnant of Israel. Like a grape gatherer, pass your hand again over its branches. To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Behold, their ears are uncircumcised. They cannot listen. Behold, the word of the Lord is to them an object of scorn. They take no pleasure in it. Therefore, I am full of the wrath of the Lord. I am weary of holding it in. Pour it out upon the children in the street and upon the gatherings of young men also. Both husband and wife shall be taken, the elderly and the very aged. Their houses shall be turned over to others, their fields and wives together, for I will stretch out my hand against the inhabitants of the land, declares the Lord. For from the least to the greatest of them, everyone is greedy for unjust gain. And from prophet to priest, everyone deals falsely. They have healed the wound of my people lightly, saying, peace, peace when there is no peace. Were they ashamed when they committed abomination? No, they were not at all ashamed. They did not know how to blush. Therefore they shall fall among those who fall. At the time that I punish them, they shall be overthrown, says the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Is the screen working? Okay. I kind of built my whole sermon around it, so I really hope it works today. <laughs> we are continuing this morning in our series that you may be one, looking at the farewell discourse of Jesus in the Gospel of John. Our text for this morning is John chapter 14, verses 27 through 31. I'd like to invite you to take your Bibles and to turn there with me, and we will stand for the reading of God's Word. Jesus said to the disciples, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am going away and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I am going to the Father. For the Father is greater than I. Now I have told you before it takes place so that when it does take place you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me, but I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise. Let us go from here. Lord Jesus, it is our desire to follow, to follow where you are calling us. It is our desire to be obedient. It is our desire to trust in you and to hear from you this day. So speak to us by your word, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Little seed and little fox, it will be okay. Trusting God through fear and Change, written by Lisa Turkhurst. In a dusty shed on a rickety shelf, hidden in a cozy packet, lived a tiny seed. Day after day, little seed watched as the farmer came into the shed. The farmer's strong hand would reach into the packet and he would say, I have a good plan for you. Each time he selected a seed. Little seed knew the farmer was good and kind, but he did not want to leave his home. Little seed liked living inside the cozy packet on the rickety shelf in the farmer's dusty shed. He did not want to go. One morning, the farmer came into the shed and he had on, as he had many days. Little seed, he said, as he placed him in his hand, I have a wonderful plan for you. I've waited for just the right time and today is the day. Oh no, please no. I don't want to go, thought the little seed. The farmer went outside and knelt down. He pushed little seed under the ground, into the dirt, and down to a deep, dark, messy place. Now, little seed, this is going to be different, and it might seem scary, but it will be okay. You can trust me, said the farmer. Little seed wished he were inside the cozy packet on the rickety shelf in the farmer's dusty shed. I want to trust, even when I can't see, But how in the world is this good for me? Little seed, come back, said little fox when he saw the farmer take his friend away. Where are you, little seed? He looked in the front of the shed and behind the shed, but little seed was not there. He looked on top of the tractor and under the tractor, but little seed was not there either. He looked under the duck's wings and inside the dog's floppy ears. He looked in the horse's stall, the pig's pen, and even in the farmer's boot. 
The little seed could not be found anywhere. Now, little fox was really worried. Little seed, he shouted. I'm here, I'm here, way down in the dirt. I'm scared and I'm lonely, but I'm not hurt. Came little seed's muffled voice right below him. Little fox thought hard for something to say or something to do that would help his friend not be scared. But he was afraid too. It's different and scary to be someplace new, but it'll be okay, little seed. Little seed was not so sure, and neither was little fox. But the farmer was good, and the farmer was kind, and the farmer was always watching over them, even when they didn't know it. Little seed sat in the dark, messy place for what seemed like a very long time. But one spring morning, little seed felt a mysterious stirring. He looked down and discovered he was no longer a little seed. He was becoming something brand new, something wonderful. He pushed up through the dark, out of the dirt, and right through the ground. There, looking sleepy-eyed and surprised, was his friend, little fox. Little fox looked down and saw a beautiful green sprout. My friend! They each exclaimed with glee. They were once again nose to nose. And little seed told silly stories. And little fox made funny faces. After many days of fun, little seed said, Little fox, look up and see. It is hard to believe what's become of me. From the messy dark place I grew and grew from a seed to a tree, only the farmer knew. Together they made it through the dark and scary time, and together they each learned that the farmer was good, and the farmer was kind, and the farmer was always watching over them, even in dark, messy places. Little seed liked things to stay the way they were, Little fox was sometimes afraid. But just as they learned to trust the farmer, we can learn to trust God. We do not need to fear. He has a wonderful plan. God loves you. And he is kind. And in the end, it really will be okay. What did the little seed know? What did it have to learn? The farmer is good. The farmer is kind. And the farmer is always watching over us. Children's stories are helpful because they help to make fundamental principles readily available. And what is the fundamental principle that this story is speaking to? What is the fundamental principle of our text for this morning? John chapter 14, verses 27 through 31. Well, they are fundamentally the same. God gives us peace that is different than the peace the world offers. And why is it different? It is different because the world's peace is based primarily on feelings. But that's not the peace that Christ offers. The peace that Christ offers is founded on what we know. And on who we know. The farmer is good. The farmer is kind. The farmer is always watching over us. That's the truth. That's what we know. The late Dallas Willard, professor of philosophy at the University of Southern California, who was a devoted follower of Christ and author of several celebrated books, in one of his last books that he published entitled Knowing Christ Today, 
defined knowledge in a particular way. He defined knowledge as follows. Quote, we have knowledge of something. When we think about something, when we speak of something, and when we treat something as it actually is on an appropriate basis of thought and experience. Knowledge involves truth based on adequate evidence, on insight. Knowing something means really understanding it, understanding reality as it actually is. Not our perception of it, not our feelings about it, but what is really true. And the world's peace is defined by how we feel, what we feel. And those feelings will change. And those feelings are fleeting. And those feelings are inherently unstable. But the peace of Christ is defined by what we know. Who we know. And the truth of what we know in Christ Jesus and the truth of knowing Christ and all that he is and all that he stands for and all that he has proclaimed will never change. Jesus knows that the disciples are starting to feel troubled. That they're starting to feel afraid because of what's happening. Here at the end of chapter 14 in the Gospel of John, they're starting to feel it. Jesus has been talking to the disciples about death, about betrayal. He's been using the language of departure. He's saying that he's going away to prepare a place for the disciples. But when the disciples' feelings are afflicted, Jesus does not reassure the disciples by attending to the disciples' feelings. Or by addressing their feelings. Rather he ministers to their troubled hearts. By speaking a word of knowledge to them. He gives them the truth. Jesus says effectively. You're feeling badly right now. But I want you to know something. I need you to know something. That will calm your troubled heart. Let the feelings follow after the truth. Let the peace come because of what you know. Jesus shares truth with the disciples. He wants them to know four things according to our text. And the first is this. The first thing that Jesus wants the disciples to know and he wants us to know in order that we might have peace that is qualitatively different than the peace that is offered in this world. The first thing is this, that the source of heavenly peace is Christ himself. Peace is the knowledge of Jesus. Knowing Christ is the truth upon which we can stand. Jesus said, peace I leave with you. My peace... I give to you. Jesus is the basis of our peace. Knowledge of Christ gives us peace. Worldly peace is sourced in all kinds of things. Things that shift and change and leave us wanting. We source our peace so often, don't we? In the strength of our networks. Those who we know that will get things done. We source our peace so often, don't we, in the strength of our personal assets and what we believe will keep us secure. We source our peace so often in our techniques or borrowing techniques that we believe will make a way. We source our peace in management skills or in the perceived expertise of the self-proclaimed experts. Frankly, our peace is often established by how much money we have in the bank and how much control we can exert over a situation or how much pain and discomfort we can ultimately avoid. That's how we define our peace. But this is worldly peace. Peace that is sourced in the ephemeral. 
peace that is sourced in the weak and the changing, peace that is established upon the unsubstantial. Christian peace is sourced in Christ, the one who was and is and is to come. Christian peace is established on the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Christian peace is established on the one who has conquered death and calls us to life. Jesus, who is the narrow road upon which we walk, a road that is firm underfoot and will never lead us astray. Jesus, who is the tree of life from which we eat and will never go hungry. Jesus, who is the well of eternal life from which we drink and will never be thirsty again. Jesus is our peace. It is cliche. But cliches often make the point. No Christ, no peace. No Christ and no peace. Jesus wants the disciples to know something, to know him. And secondly, Jesus wants us to know, the disciples to know, that Christian peace is sourced in the knowledge that Christ will come and find us. No matter where we are. Jesus said in verse 28, I'm going away. And I will come to you. There is no dark hole that you might find yourself in. That Jesus the good farmer. That Jesus the good shepherd cannot and will not find you. Christ knows exactly where you are. And he will come to you. Are you in a hole? Are you in a dark and scary place? It's messy and uncertain. Jesus knows where you are. And he will find you. Thirdly, Jesus wants us to know that Christian peace is sourced and the knowledge that God the Father is great. The farmer was good. And God is good. But the goodness of God is not the full truth about the Father. What Jesus wants us to know is that the Father is not just good. He is great. Even greater than Jesus. Jesus says to the disciples, and Jesus says to us, look at the span of my ministry. Remember all of the marvelous works from the turning of the water into wine at the wedding feast in Cana, to the feeding of the 5,000, to the resurrection of Lazarus from the grave. Remember all that you have seen and heard and marveled at. Remember the cross and the resurrection of my life for you. Remember how great all of those things are and as great of all those works are and as great as Jesus has been in his teaching with authority, with ministering to the least, the last, and the lost, the Father is greater. And here's what you need to know. The Father loves you. He loves you. You can rest in peace. You can know that you have a great father in heaven that knows you. Cares for you. And finally, fourthly, the thing that Jesus wants us to know is that Christian peace is sourced in a knowledge that is proven and verifiable. In verse 29 of our text, Jesus said, And now I have told you this before it takes place, so that when it does take place, you can believe. The knowledge of Christ offers peace because it is truth that is based upon adequate evidence and insight. As Willard defined Knowledge, we have knowledge of something when we think about something, speak of something, treat something as it actually is. 
on an appropriate basis of thought and experience. Knowledge involves truth based on adequate evidence or insight. And so Jesus offers information in advance so that it can be objectively verified as true. He offers it in advance so that we can verify the trustworthiness of his word and his claims. And Jesus said, I'm going away and I'm coming back. And that's exactly what he did. And so we can trust him. He speaks the truth. And so when he says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, we can count on it. Today, feelings are king. The emotions reign supreme. We no longer have a knowledge-based culture. We have a feelings-based culture. The rise and triumph of the therapeutic. What we believe, what we think we know is true, is largely predicated today on how it makes us feel. If something makes us feel uneasy, well, then it must be wrong. You made me feel bad, so you must have done something inappropriate. It's a feelings-based culture that tells us and confirms in us what we think is true. I was interested in reading further this week in my preparation Dallas Willard's diagnosis of our culture today, the way in which it is feelings-based. He wrote, It has become an unquestioned moral assumption of most Western cultures, and certainly of North American ones, that people should be free. What that means in the popular mind and popular culture is that people should be permitted, if not actually enabled, to do what they want. This is almost always joined with the assumption that what people want to do is to enjoy pleasure. Sometimes they speak of happiness, but that term has little meaning to most folks other than feeling good. So it is now generally thought that desiring to do something is a sufficient or at least a a weighty reason for doing it. From this, we get our overall culture of sensuality in which people are almost totally governed by their feelings. Because we are a culture ruled by emotions... Because we are a culture that is governed by our feelings, ours is a very sensual culture. Just watch TV or the internet for five minutes and you'll see that that is true. But ours is also, because we are a feelings-based culture, ours is also a very anxious culture. An easily offended culture. Today in our culture, there is really no place for truth, which means there's no place for peace. Find me a community. Find me a person that is riddled with turmoil, anxiety, despair, worry, fear, recrimination, and malice, and I will find you a community I will find you a person that is largely governed by feelings and not the knowledge of the truth. The only way out of this turmoil is to stand. To stand on the knowledge of the truth. And that is the peace that Christ offers. Christ wants you to know the truth. Jesus said, I will no longer talk much with you for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me, Jesus said. I do as the Father has commanded me so that the world may know. Know that I love the Father. Arise. 
let us go from here. There's a lot of chaos in this world. A little peace. For the ruler of this world is making war on the world. And the ruler of this world is making war on the church. And in the midst of that chaos, Christ has something to say. It is curious to hear. Jesus doesn't say, feel better. Jesus doesn't nurse our hurt feelings. He doesn't indulge our fears He says this, the world has no claim on me. I'm going. I am going to obey the Father so that the world may know that I love the Father. Christ is all in on obedience to the Father because he loves the Father. And Jesus tells us the truth. So that we can know. Jesus says, rise. Let's go. And they go in peace. What do you know? How will you go? Let us pray. Lord Jesus... It is our desire to be at peace. And it is our desire to be united with you and with one another. We desire to be your church without spot or wrinkle. None of this can happen unless you speak a word of truth to us. None of this can happen unless you call us to arise and to stand upon the truth of your word the life that you have called us to. Help us to be found faithful, obedient to Christ, obedient to you, Jesus, even as you are obedient to the Father. Grant us your peace, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. This time I'd like to invite the ushers to come forward to wait upon you as we continue to worship through the giving of our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings. you bless our lives far abundantly more than we deserve 
And you give us the opportunity to return to you our thanks and our thanksgiving in song and in affirmation and through the giving of these gifts, these offerings. Pray, Lord, that they would indeed be used for the advancement of your kingdom and for the promotion of your peace. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Would you stand with me as we sing the threefold amen? We rest on thee. We'll sing verse in one and three only. was good. The farmer was kind. The farmer is always watching over you. And so now go out of the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast that which is good. Render to no man evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all men and women. Love and serve the Lord. Rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each one of you. Today, tomorrow, until Jesus comes again. And then indeed it shall be forevermore. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Go in peace. There is nothing greater than the people of God joining together for worship on the Lord's Day. We're so very glad that you have been with us this morning on our live stream. We started our live stream ministry a number of years ago to serve those who could not be with us in residential worship. Here at Beverly Heights Church, we place a high value on worship. We believe that God has called us to gather by his love for us each and every Lord's Day. If you are close to us here in the greater Pittsburgh region, I want to personally welcome you and invite you to come and join with us in residential worship if you find yourself able. For those of you who may be joining us this morning who are not in the greater Pittsburgh region, 
I want to encourage you to consider finding a local church where you can worship on the Lord's Day. You could even consider going to the EPC's website where they have a church locator to help you find a local church home. God bless.